All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, uh, this evening, we shall be talking about OpenStreetMap in Belgium, um, some of the projects we've been working on, some of the issues with, we've been struggling with recently. Um, this is brought to you by uh, Jonathan Berrien, a uh, member of the OpenStreetMap Belgium board, uh, Pieter van der Vennet, who will be assimilated, resistance is futile, into the Belgian OpenStreetMap board at some point, um, but who is also a very important member of our community, of course. Um, and myself, uh, Joost Schroepen, uh, also a member of the Belgian OpenStreetMap board. Um, uh, let me see. Um, so, oh yeah. Uh, so we have a bunch of topics uh, that we prepared a bit about. Um, feel free to add more uh, topics uh, at the back of the the shared notes. Uh, so you have some shared notes, and and on on the left of your page, you see people talking. Uh, the the list of speakers, and you should see uh, something with a shared chat and and shared notes. Um, so uh, feel free to add no, uh, suggestions under the shared notes. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, you can ask them at any point uh, in the chat. And for every topic, we will stop a few minutes to, to allow for discussion. So the, the idea is that uh, we uh, talk about this. So we didn't prepare fancy presentations. We're going to do this the OpenStreetMap way, which is fun and chaotic. Um, so, um, uh, topic number one is the uh, open street view. That's what we named it. Um, so, um, what is this about? Uh, so, everyone knows Google Street View. And uh, Google Street View is really awesome. Um, so, if uh, you can go to any point in the world and look around and see what reality looks like. Now, we're making a map of the world. And so having the ability to, uh, from our desk, be able to look around and see what the reality uh, looks like is pretty awesome. Um, of course, uh, Google Maps needs to make money and they don't allow us to use their data. And then you would say, well, the government also needs that stuff and um, they collect this data as well. Um, so maybe they can share it with us. And that was uh, it was a large frustration in, in Flanders up until a few years ago that the local government, in fact, did invest in uh, such imagery. So there was a, a Google Street View alternative with very good quality images, uh, but it was completely close to us. And the main reason is that they uh, they didn't buy pictures. They bought access to a system that has pictures. And so the, the, um, the cost could be lower because the company making the pictures could sell them to several people, which is awesome for them, but less awesome for us. Um, so um, a year and a half or so ago, uh, they decided to, to stop that system because it was getting too expensive. Um, and um, and a lot of people who became who came to be dependent on on that data uh, suddenly had a problem. Uh, so we did um, a campaign with with OpenStreetMap Belgium to talk to as much people as possible about um, open alternatives. Um, so, for example, we use uh, Mapillary uh, intensively ourselves. Uh, in, in in Belgium, it's it's quite popular. There's several million images uh, available there, and then with an open license. Um, so one way to uh, for for uh, government to adapt to this new problem uh, is to simply uh, share imagery there, and then everyone benefits. So the pictures only have to be taken once, and then uh, everyone can consume them. Um, Another alternative is that you say, okay, we need more than just images. So uh, one of the uh, so the government likes to do fancy things with, with these images. Uh, for example, the the the, the cars driving around taking the images. They they uh, have equipment of fifty thousand dollars or something in, on the roof. Well, probably euros. Um, and they also make a lidar, uh, so so a sort of three D model of the environment. 
which afterwards allows you to uh, measure the exact width of uh, of, a, of a sidewalk, for example, on top of the pictures. And that makes it a lot more expensive to, to collect the data. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why it needs to be sold to, to different people to, to be worth uh, collecting this data. Um, so considering that that was needed for a lot of uh, partners, our suggestion was like, hey, if you have a big project like that, we totally understand that you can't be the owner of all the data that's collected, but why don't you uh, make an agreement that just the imagery itself uh, can be shared in an open way? Um, and so we, we did have some success. Uh, so there are uh, some uh, intercommunales, um, some cooperation groups between municipalities that are doing experiments with uh, mapillary and do-it-yourself uh, solutions. There's uh, Van Steeland, uh, who is one of the providers of uh, typical 360 degree imagery, who is contributing to mapillary, uh, I suppose, when they get paid by a, a municipality. Um, but, um, there is um, most of the investment seems to be going in the way of closed solutions again. So there is a, a big project by Fluvius, if I recall correctly, um, where um, anyone can can like join a group of people who get access to imagery, and so they have to buy their way in. Um, and the imagery is never available for anyone outside it. So basically, it's a continuation of the old system um, without uh, anything better for us and, and the rest of the world uh, with regards to, to access. So that was a little painful when, when that news uh, struck. Um, so we're still working with, with local players uh, to, to show them the flexibility of, uh, of, of DIY solutions where you buy cheap equipment and, and, and just uh, collect the data yourself, be it 360 degrees or, uh, or a simple GoPro. Um, uh, but it's, uh, it's been challenging and, uh, and a little disappointing. So we, we tried to build a campaign. We also did a press release, um, but... Um, yeah, uh, I would say that we kind of failed. Um, so if uh, anyone has, uh, I, so, so one of the reasons to bring this here was to see if anyone has ideas on how we can uh, we can improve that and, and, and uh, also um, we can show a little what, what is possible now with uh, existing tools. I don't know, Jonathan or Peter, if you have anything to add. I see Thibaut is typing up something. He's not. Camera's back. Yeah, my camera died. Do do we know the status of Open Street Cam project? Is it still? Uh, yeah, it uh, changed names. Um, yeah. So it used to be from Till Enough, uh, but then it was sold to Grab together with a lot of the software from from Till Enough. Um, so and Grab is a, a large uh, taxi company uh, based in in Southeast Asia, um, and they uh, they do all their routing based on Open Street Map. So that's hence the interest. Um, and they renamed it to Cartaview. Oh. Uh, so far, they are just keeping it alive and uh, being shocked at how much it costs them to keep it <laughs> running. Because it's, yeah. Oh, yeah, quite an important detail about mapillary. So the one that, that we are using most, um, it's, it's neatly integrated into OpenStreetMap um, tools. Um, uh, but Mapillary has been sold to uh, to Facebook, and of course, Facebook isn't exactly popular in uh, the uh, world of open source. Some other worlds neither, I suppose. Um, so far, uh, the impact has been positive. Uh, 
um, in the sense that it used to be um, uh, you used to have to pay a huge amount of money to be able to use uh, data that was generated uh, on top of the images or to even have access to images as a as a private company or as a as an organization a, a municipality for example and uh, from the day facebook took over they totally made everything free um, which is pretty fun so now you can just go to mapillary make an account and start downloading machine generated data about uh, where the traffic signs are Um, yeah, do, do we know the one Facebook bought Mapillary, the impact? Because I know of well, some of our users that decided to remove all their pictures. Do we know the percentage of, of picture lost, let's say, in the, in, in the process? I've, I've never seen anything uh, indicating that. Looking at the evolution of the coverage and, and and so on i have the impression that the impact is relatively minor but i uh, i don't know if it's if, if anyone has tried to quantify that I see Stan is still typing. Uh, do feel free to to uh, to just speak up. We do not bite. Occasionally we do, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, as Dan is commenting, IEV right now. So IEV is the, the part of the Flemish government that used to run the imagery. And they are in, I, I, I suppose they're uh, not in a financial position right now to, uh, to, yeah, to, to revive such a project. So it's, it's basically their decision to, to stop it. Um, and it's a bit of a shame mm -hmm. that no, no structure was put in place to, to replace it with a different financial model. I don't know what, why you that never happened. I've heard that the IV has certainly no plans to make a new set of uh, yeah. uh, street view images. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Jean-Marie shared something about uh, the um, yeah. <laughs> thermography area. I don't know how to say that in English. Um, that's also something we noticed that there is, um, there's uh, related products that are also, uh, that also raise a lot of interest, like uh, the uh, ob oblique I views. Actually, I have a uh, Lishfan, how do you call that in English? I don't know. Whatever. The the person in charge of in the in the municipality is a professor at the ULB in uh, how do you call it? Chimie physique. I don't mm -hmm. know that in English. She is uh, working with uh, uh, infrared. Uh, satellite images to analyze the composition of the atmosphere. She is working for the IPCC, GIEC in France, in French. IPCC, you know what? Uh, I don't know if you know the acronym. You, do you know the acronym? I, Le GIEC, Groupe uh, International uh, d'Etude uh, sur le Climat. IPCC is uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. the International uh, Climate Change Panel. Climate change, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, she's working on that too. And uh, she is also here. 
So she more or less knows <laughs> what it is all about, I guess. Hmm. And they yes. they say the the resolution is uh, forty five centimeters. And as they measure the ver in various uh, wavelengths, they can uh, they could uh, spot uh, animals in the woods, <laughs> right? Chevreuil. I don't know what that is in English or in in in, uh, in Dutch. Chevreuil is a kind of uh, I don't know. It, it's something like a meter, meter, meter twenty yeah. high. Yeah, like a small deer. Yeah, Goats. exactly. No, 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 not a chevre, a chevre uh, re in Dutch. Okay, so yeah. they they say they could count them mm. as a as a, on the side, <laughs> if I may say so. <laughs> Alderman, oh yeah. So I and one um, one Thank more thing perhaps to mention about uh, the uh, about mapillary is that we made uh, two organizations on uh, on mapillary. Uh, one is this one. Um, so that map should show you the coverage of images that uh, we made with uh, a single sponsored camera. Um, so they they donated a GoPro to OpenStream at Belgium, which has been with me most of the time. Um, but it's traveled a bit uh, through Thierry from the Fietsersbond, and uh, you, uh, better known as Polyglot around here, um, did all the cycle uh, well, all the proposed cycle highways um, with that camera. Uh, so it's about. Um, a million uh, pictures that we took with that in a little over a, over a year. Um, and um, in an effort to get them to donate more um, uh, from uh, more cameras to us, uh, we also uh, have uh, the second organization um, where uh, anyone who is a member of OpenStreetMap Belgium can join. And then we have a neat little map of all the images taken by uh, people who are, uh, well, who consider themselves uh, a member of OpenStreetMap Belgium. Um, and that's also uh, quite an impressive amount of uh, images already uploaded there. The statistics aren't loading right now, but uh, the coverage is pretty neat. Um, and these images, of course, help your daily mapping. Right. Anything else related to this topic? I didn't look at the shared notes. If anything's coming up there, or not. Oh, nice. So in in uh, Holland or in the Netherlands, they have a, a bird's eye perspective. So ah, this ob oblique uh, kind of imagery. Um, that's uh, pretty awesome. Um, okay. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, that that's something we can use um, when people say, "Yeah, but you can't share this." It's like in Holland, they can. Uh, all right. Uh, next topic then. Um, it's the Battle of the Pads. Uh, so a, a few years back, we had a first kind of battle of the paths, um, where uh, suddenly we saw an influx of uh, of people interested in in trage wegen, uh, slow roads, as as uh, as we like to call them. Um, so basically, any path or trail or road where cars uh, can't go. Um, and uh, that was really fun uh, because the uh, the people who are interested in that stuff they used to make uh, Excel sheets and paper maps and Google Maps uh, their own projects and and all sorts of stuff to uh, to collect uh, this data about about this, the little trails and finally they had like a common database where uh, all this information can be shared in a, in a structured way and where it actually helps to preserve these paths because of a path that is mapped 
is a path that maybe will be used a little more. Um, there were some small issues in uh, from the start because uh, what's a path to someone is not always a path to someone else. Um, so, um, for example, a typical example of something that causes controversy is uh, if there is a path that goes through a field uh, and you can only see it sometimes if you're lucky. Um, so there's there's people using the path maybe sometimes a little and then you can see that the crops are, are, uh, are dead there, uh, but most of the year you don't see anything. Um, so we had lo lots of cases like that where we started getting a few complaints from people with their uh, mountain bike uh, using OpenStreetMap to find ways and saying, hey, uh, this, this path you mapped it really doesn't exist. Um, so we had a little, uh, a few issues there. Um, but then Corona happens, um, and um, uh, suddenly uh, everything changed. So before Corona, we had an occasional complaint as well from people saying, hey, uh, this path is really my path and no one should be allowed to, uh, to use it. Um, um, but that was really rare, I think one or two cases before Corona. And um, really from, from April, May, it went up to one or two complaints per week uh, from people saying, hey, uh, this path, you really can't, can't use it and it's my private property and then and, and, uh, uh, making complaints sometimes, uh, threatening with lawyers, and we laugh a little. Um, but then in a later phase as well, uh, we got complaints from uh, occasionally from Naturpunt uh, because people use uh, paths which are uh, within uh, nature reserves and in sensitive areas uh, and from from um, uh, Garde Forestière uh, Boswachters, I have no idea in, in English, um, who um, try to keep people on the proper paths within their um, within the areas they manage. Um, so we, we really had a, a huge influx of that sort of case. Um, and it's, uh, so it's, it's been a, a challenge to deal with it. Um, so uh, one of the things we did was over time standardize replies so that we don't have to write a whole uh, letter every time. Uh, so we, we, we started with one letter and then re rewrote it. And in the end, it turned out to be something we can reuse most of the time. Um, the the important thing there is that uh, usually people will ask us to delete this path um, but we can't do that because we well sometimes we can but in most cases we can't uh, because OpenStreetMap maps the uh, everything that you can actually see so if you can go somewhere and there is no uh, nothing blocking your passage to go there is no sign that it's private and you can actually see that there's a path there then we will map the path and if you say it doesn't exist then we say our eyes tell tell us differently um, so what we do instead is that we mark the path as private if we believe that the people making the complaint are are correct um, and that's very hard to do so in, in most cases we just accept what they are saying um, but often we find we, we look for some input from people from Tragewegen or from the local municipality or from uh, Balnam, for example, in Wallonia um, to, to get some input about whether or not uh, a path is actually legally accessible or not. Um, at, but it's still it is it is murky. Um, it's it's I, the people I see. So uh, Vincent Vincent is from Tragewegen, I believe. So perhaps you can talk, talk, tell a bit about how hard it is to to uh, sometimes find out the, the truth of, of of whether or not a path is, uh, is publicly accessible. Um, um, and so over the year. Uh, so yeah, Yannick, if they are, we do. Uh, if if they are private, we set them to private. Um, but if uh, so, for example, um, a path that has existed for thirty years, uh, or at least thirty years, and has been in de facto use for that time, is legally accessible. Um, so you can't just change it. Uh, I I mean, it would be wrong to map it as private. Um, even if, if the owner suddenly decides that they don't want to allow access anymore. 
so there there are some some rules and, and regulations in place there. Um, the the most interesting part to us was that suddenly we were relevant. So um, before no one cared what was mapped in OpenStreetMap, and and now all of a sudden, um, apparently people are using our data to find uh, their way. They actually know that they are using our da data to find their way. So they, they're, they're using an app that makes it clear to them that they use OpenStreetMap. And uh, people who see them passing by, so the owners, the, proper, uh, the, the, the ones who have the property, um, they, uh, they ask people and they get to know like, oh yeah, we find a way here because it is an OpenStreetMap. Um, so that was a, an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting experience this year. Um, it does mean a lot of work, a lot of discussion, and a lot of working together. I wonder is if uh, Kevin here is um, uh, from RootU. There's a Kevin at RootU. I don't know if it's the same. Um, so we're... Uh, <laughs> hello, Kevin. Uh, so we are uh, talking to RootU. I'm a little slow to respond to your mails, Kevin. Sorry. Um, to to see if we can if we can standardize our policies a bit to to uh, better work together because a lot of people also go to root you to complain about uh, the underlying map so they have the added problem that uh, people will create uh, uh, tracks uh, of of where they hiked or biked uh, to um, and and upload them and of course if uh, someone uploads a, a hike that someone else can then go follow uh it's a little annoying if that's over private property um so uh to answer Nathan, so some paths uh, are limited use uh, for example only accessible for pedestrians not uh, mountain bike um and yes a lot of that is unclear on the map it is pretty hard to uh, to show all that level of detail on a map, there are some uh, good uh, attempts to do that. For example, the Wanderride Karte uh, does an excellent job if you happen to ride a horse. Uh, I, I haven't seen an equivalent for uh, for cyclists, um, but any routing application will uh, will do a good job. So the, if you if you trust your router, then you will uh, get a route that avoids uh, paths where you're not allowed. One of the issues also the way apps or websites are rendered uh, private because for some apps it's really clear it's even, even written access private on the default style it's great so it's quite clear if, well if you know if you know it but of, of on some some apps they just map it. The, the same way, just paths that do not uh, map the way that's private or not. So I think for the user, it's not clear enough on the on the app that the, that that path is actually uh, private. Um, perhaps something about the limited access in the nature reserves or areas which are managed by uh, Naturpunt or INB. Um, I try to follow those access re restrictions, whether I'm on foot or on mountain bike, and I try to add them, or I tried to add them to OpenStreetMap, but it's, I stopped doing it because it's it's just impossible. Uh, because you have uh, parts which uh, have a sign that's forbidden on the one side and on the other side it's not. Uh, access only for uh, hikers on the one side and on the other side, not uh, mountain bike routes together with a sign only except uh, only uh, pedestrians uh, and all those things. Any impossible combination you can imagine you find on the field. Uh, so I stopped doing that uh, and uh, I have wanted to send an email to those organizations about them, but I know better than them where the signs are, so I <laughs> I use that information to go where perhaps I shouldn't go, but I don't, um, uh, I, I just still follow the signs which are there. And I know at, from which side I can enter an area without uh, 
Um, uh, yeah. it's without uh, doing something that's forbidden. Uh, right. But yeah, it's, that makes it impossible to to add it to the map. Um, yeah, and those people can say what they want from a turpent uh, of AMB, but uh, as far as I know, the signs count. And I've tried to s to find some information on the internet about which paths are accessible to which users, but I haven't been able to find anything about that. Uh, we we recently had a meeting with AMB. Uh, mostly, we can blame Peter uh, for that. Um, so there was uh, someone deleting a lot of forests in the Arboretum in the Forêt de Soigne in the Zonio out. Um, and uh, well, we started undeleting and, and well, no, wait, we started complaining like, hey, please don't delete pods uh, if they still exist. Um, and so finally, we we uh, we went there and we talked to to several of of uh, of the people at ANB. And they talked about uh, what, what Kevin just po uh, posted, uh, that apparently there are detailed plans. Um, and they, they said they were reworking all of them so that they should become better in the future. And in theory, we should be able, yeah, so there's, OK, right now, um, I don't know what they, I don't know how useful they are, how, how hard it is to use them in practice. Um, uh, but so in theory, uh, they should become a lot better soon. Uh, I've I've also received already a data set from the the Brussels part of the uh, Forêt de Soigne, um, and the, well, the first case I checked said cyclists only, and pedestrians were allowed in reality as well. So, um, yeah, uh, everyone thinks their data is correct, and it never is. Um, well, all data are correct, obviously. Yes. No, they're not. They're, <laughs> they're, they're as correct as you want them to be, or as, as you make them. Um, yeah. Uh, so the what what Stan was also also mentioned was the. Um, like all the wrong traffic signs. So we even uh, started a, a sub, uh, a little subgroup uh, of OSM Belgian people who like to be annoyed by that um, to to see if we can make a, a sort of database of wrong traffic signs to to keep track of them and to report them to, to local government and, and to have like a structured place to, to collect all of that. Um, we were, we tried uh, the Fix My Street platform um, but we didn't have uh, enough developer power to to keep uh, to keep that going. It's it's a little too complicated to set it up. Um, so we're thinking. Um, I'll I'll post uh, the link. Um, uh, Stan. Um, and um, uh, let me see. What was I? Uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, so we're we're thinking we're thinking uh, of maybe just doing something on GitHub with a linked uh, U map that shows the the GitHub issues on the map or something like that, uh, so so that we at least have something. Um, yeah, and to get them actually fixed, it really depends on on who you ask. It's in one municipality they fix it within days, and in others you never get any response at all. Uh, Sepa, that looks like an interesting video. So, uh, Kevin, now that we we have you here, uh, perhaps you you can talk a bit about how how things are going on the root use side. I might be interested to hear how it how it is in practice. Yeah, sure. Um, corona happened also, <laughs> um, but but I think it's been a constant since the beginning of Route 2 that people have remarks about uh, the routes going along private roads. But I think, if I have to put a number on it, I think 
before Corona, we had one a week, I think. And now it's approximately four or five a week. Um, and previously, there were most of them were objectively uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense that it, it was um, obvious what the solution what the solution was. Uh, for example, um, something is private uh, or it's said by the, the owner of the road, it's private. Um, in other cases, it's more a subjective uh, kind of um, remark, and it's sometimes difficult to to analyze. Um, for us, what we use is we we have a um, a plan which we follow step by step, actually, um, where we try to um, evaluate the the remark that is made by just. Um, one thing is checking all the routes uh, going along these paths um, and checking the score. We, we have a score per route and then the stars. And if you have three, four or five stars, it's actually a verified route. So so actually the, the distribution of, of, uh, of scores of the routes along these paths also tell us something about uh, the, 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 the quality of the remark made. Um, and then, then we try to uh, use other sources or, or um, partnerships. We, we sometimes contact Trahawegen uh, if it's really a, a, a strange case um, to just get a good solution for the for the people making the remark, but also for the users uh, making the routes. It's sometimes a combination and finding the right balance between them, because. The, the on the on the side of the 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 uh, problem reporter uh, it's it's often a story of a, of a lot of frustrations uh, and it's it's sometimes very difficult i think you 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 see the same uh, when you get the mails probably um there are often a lot of frustrations about we um probably uh, or or sending everyone along these spots which is most often not the the, the case but um, yeah it's 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 finding the right balance between between helping the the, the problem reporters and and helping the users making the routes and, and finding the right solution uh, in that case um, what we also do is if we if we verify a problem report um, if it's uh, in our eyes uh, true, that the uh, path is is private. We also uh, proactively go and check all the routes um, and remove them from our public platform and and notify the the authors of the routes uh, to to um, to the fact that that their route is along a, a private road and they should avoid it in their route. So we can just yeah we can't uh, how do you say it. Um, um, make sure they don't follow the route but we can try to give them the necessary information to to avoid those paths um that's probably the story of of what we do and and how we try to handle it but it's 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 increasing <laughs> week by week the the reports um and we 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 try to solve them as good as possible and then try to um input everything in OpenStreetMap if we're sure about the remark and, and we have enough information to, to, to verify it because uh, we can't just go um, to the, 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 the street and check everything. But if we have enough, of it, enough information and we're 99% sure, we're changing OpenStreetMap to, to, to solve and fix it. And most often, for example, in, in, in cases of, of private roads it's like like also mentioned earlier it's setting it to private and that's most often the the solution to it and uh, something we did recently is also but it, it's what it was also mentioned already is is trying to visualize it more clearly on the map which is which roads are are private to try and 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 help users uh see where where there are private roads the, the routing engines avoid these roads but in some cases people still try to manually plan a route and and try to take roads which are not really uh, accessible so we try to to 
improve the visibility of private roads but it's yeah finding a balance and, and trying to to make it clear and obvious what's happening it's probably uh yeah my story yeah and at some point your own responsibility ends and it's the and it's the people who actually go out there that have the responsibility yeah, sure, right yeah, yeah, the, That's, it's, yeah. But, but a lot of people who, who use uh, Rutu or another uh, app um, just refer to us as the responsibles or the, the just avoid their own responsibility and just say, oh, the app uh, uh, showed me uh, along that way. So it's, it's their problem. It's not my problem. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a battle of the parts. <laughs> Yeah, as uh, Sapa mentioned, uh, it's also because of, uh, of people uh, abusing uh, parts. So, um, yeah. So I yeah. think when you're using the public domain, it's not just about not leaving a negative impact, but actually leaving a positive impact. So if you go walking on a nice little path and you see some idiot left, uh, um, uh a red bull can there that's usually what it is or jupiter just take it along and if you think what that's crazy well you also accidentally have dropped garbage in the past so maybe you're just compensating for your own accidents people yeah. make mistakes yeah it's, it's really a good remark of sepa it's it's there's a lot of frustrations and you have to try to find a, mm. a positive story in it and try to yeah try to find yeah. a balance between it yeah and then since corona yeah it's more frustrating pro probably like yeah, i don't know yeah. well so in my experience uh if you go somewhere where you can really only go on foot uh it's usually clean like people leave a mess when you can access with a car <laughs> Not that, yeah. and you can only access on foot but it, yeah it depends of course on where you are yeah, it's, re it's really different when i had a, a uh, another nice example of, of um, a path in, um, I think it was in, in Melle, in Melle, which was accessible. I think it's it's um, uh, I don't know how you say it. It's a, it's a permissive use of a, of a road, but uh, we we got the remark of the the farmer. Um, his land is uh, up near the road, but the the road is actually uh, in such a bad quality uh, that that people start to um, go around the path or or um go b beside the path and and then go over his crops and and start uh destroying the crops and and he was yeah. looking for a solution for it i that that's a case where i i i don't want to 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 block the path because it's it's actually public domain and it's it's permissive use of the of the of a path but yeah and that was a difficult one to find an actual solution for it. I don't really know if if, if there is a, a a good solution. Um, well, if if it's an officially, I, at some point the municipality is obligated to to uh, take care of the path. So yeah. if it's in a really bad state, maybe they they should fix it. <laughs> uh, I, I think it, I think the the path belonged to Electrabel. Or it was part of a near a, a, a railroad. I don't know for sure. Yeah. And so, and the the, the if if it's electrical, they they allowed the the use of the path. But I don't know if they if they if they, if they yeah. really um, maintain the road. <laughs> That's yeah. The, yeah. Uh, we're also just talking about the cases that get to us. Um, so there is also uh, some some so that's a little weird in the case of OpenStreetMap because anyone can just delete everything they want. Uh, and so fortunately, people aren't doing that uh, very much, uh, but it does happen. Um, and we're fortunate enough to have a, a Jaka. Um, who um so that's one of our contributors um who sends a welcome message to every new mapper in belgium 
Um, and um, meanwhile, checks what first edits they have made. So if you come to OpenStreetMap specifically to delete some parts, then we will notice. Um, and so we we now have a policy to just uh, revert it uh, if if it's if it's clear that they should have been marked as private and and set them as private and then sort out the details later. And of course, there's still a lot of paths and tracks which have been armchair mapped. Uh, which have never been checked what the status is, and they are they're, they're, they're in the database, and everyone and it looks as if they're public parts. Yeah, but often they aren't. Yeah, yeah. And what what adds to the to the murkiness there is that if you so one of the sources I use myself to to check the age of a path is is the NGI base maps. Um, but those don't have any information about accessibility. They don't visualize that at all. So it's really hard to uh, to do that. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of roads out there that are mapped um, uh, based on, on official data, on imagery, without a survey, and then pretty obviously private roads get mapped as just any other road. And that that is indeed a, a nuisance. Yeah, and I guess a lot of the reason we have so much issues right now is because of this little virus thingy that's going around. Um, and and so probably once that all blows over in the next decade or so, uh, then then the pressure on the parts will will get a little lower again, and maybe we will have less problems. Um, I hope the people who found their way to OpenStreetMap will keep finding their way to OpenStreetMap. Though, at least we have now more information about that about how many people are using OpenStreetMap. Exactly. Than we <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, one of the interesting cases, but I think Jonathan followed that up, um, was where the the, mili the the Department of Defense asked us to delete some roads uh, because they were on uh, on military domains, and before we complied, uh, we looked at how it is mapped on the official government data and it had more detail than that than what we offered <laughs> so we were like why should we delete it if you yourself offer it so i don't think they they ever followed up right no, no no but it was really a really legal document from the ministry of defense so that's pretty mm. <laughs> scary at yeah. first yeah. uh but yeah it was about yeah mapping uh, and also i really imagery because some areas it has to be uh, uh, blurred, but we do not provide uh, aerial imagery, so we're like, eh. <laughs> but indeed, so it was pretty scary. But I, I, I don't even think we replied. I don't exactly remember, but uh, but yeah, I think they just heard about OpenStreetMap. They checked once in the in a base somewhere. They noticed something mapped and then and then uh, send send the, the whole legal department but no as far as i know there was no no follow up on, on that all right anything else on paths um all right then we can go to the map complete section um, Peter, uh, I feel like I've talked enough for three days, so over to you. <laughs> yes, okay, so uh, good evening everyone. So um, we also wanted to use this uh, gathering to introduce a new editor that I've made together with the help from uh, some other people. Um, so... Um, First of all, let us start with showing what it is. So, 
Um, for a project a while back, I'm going to start screen sharing. So for a project a while back, uh, people wanted to have an editor to make an inventorization of uh, parks and forests and stuff. And it had to be really good and it had to be really simple to use. And so I built them that thing. Uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, but I felt, so if we want to show the original one, uh, so it was with Corona and it was uh, the party, the green party, and they wanted to make an inventorization of parks so people could go walk and they wanted to do uh, sourcing stuff and, and it had to be open. Um, so I made them that and then uh, you could, oh, this is broken. You could like answer questions about the parks and the playgrounds and stuff. So, or for example, about the viewpoint, you could like add a few questions. But then I thought, okay, this was really cool. But what if we could make it for more? So I set it up, it was that it could be really general. In the summer, uh, at Open Summer of Code, we made a team for uh, cyclists for bicycle pumps bicycle shops all stuff fun like that for example uh, there is a bicycle uh, oh it's all hanging for a minute so for example there is a cool bicycle tube vending machine here or there is a uh, bicycle pump over there if it wants to open why is everything always broken when you deem it? So you have the bicycle pump here. Um, so, and that's even that wasn't enough. So because we felt there, there's a lot more that could be done with it. So for the OpenStreetMap people themselves, we also made a way that it's really easy to uh, extend it and it, that it's really easy to make your own team. And that was a success. Uh, because right now there's already like 15, no, even 20 teams which are uh, there. But there's also people who made their own team. So these are all teams that were created just by people like you and me. Uh, so yeah, we have a very flexible and easy to use editor now. Uh, go on and use it. Um, you can make the presentation full screen, by the way. I don't think that's for me. Ben also already shared the link. So, um, for map complete, uh, so in general, what can you do with it? You can visualize that. It's both a map viewer and an editor. You can easily show very in-depth what data what data is there for a specific topic. Topic. Um, it's generic. Well, it's a single team is not generic, but you can make a team for whatever you want. And furthermore, it's a single HTML page. You can open it on your computer. You can open it on your phone. Uh, so it's cross-platform. And furthermore, uh, what's even more important, it opens the door for new people to get editing. It's built specifically to be really easy for new editors to use for people who had never ever touched Yes software closely. It's also built that if the team is good, it's really hard to fuck up. So if you answer a question and yeah, you're not lying, it should have the right tagging. It should be correct by default. Um, and the idea is also that um, that it's embeddable in other websites. The idea is that a government website or a website for a certain niche of, or a certain community just embeds the map like they do now with a Google My Maps thing. But that instead of making 10 Google My Maps for every municipality one, that there's one single shared instance based on OpenStreetMap so that all the data 
is um, kept together and all the data is stored in OpenStreetMap together. Um, yeah, you also already shared uh, another team of surveillance cameras, which is pretty cool too. Now, um, there's also some stats. Uh, so I didn't really prepare my talk, as you could have noticed, but I compiled some stats to past hour, which is pretty cool as well. Um, in the past nine months, because it only was deployed first in like June last year. Uh, we reached, or rather, MapComplete reached. Um, all right, no stats. Reached around um, 300 or 400 different contributors, so that's already quite a lot. Uh, the stats from last year. Uh, in, in 2020, there were uh, 350 unique contributors with MapComplete. That's more than MapContrib, which was pretty cool. Uh, furthermore, uh, there's also... Uh, I think your screen is not shared anymore, Peter. Yeah, I know, uh, but okay. I'm gonna compile some stats. Um, so, in total, there were 368 unique contributors up to this point. The most active contributors with around 460 edits was, well, myself, which is quite logical because I test constantly and I use it. Uh, a, clo a second most active contributor is uh, you, Joost, with 74 contributions. Uh, yeah, um, I also have to admit that uh, at the beginning of MapComplete, the change set handling was different. So if you made a change, you waited 30 seconds, and you made another change, it, was, it would be two different change sets. And as Joost was already involved quite in the beginning, Joost made quite some change sets, and I made quite some change sets that way too. The yeah, handling is I no still, different. I, I still use it though. I mean, uh, when I see a bicycle pump, then I yeah. grab map complete because it asks me the mm -hmm. questions and it's just click a click and it's ready and you don't have to think what, what's the tag again or... Yeah. And then there's also another few contributors. There's also a certain contributor uh, uh, yeah, so uh, lots of people from the Belgian community, because the Belgian community knows it all best. Um, then another fun overview, and uh, I'm going to open up the screen share, and then you can see how sloppily I've been making the, the stats. Um, So another really interesting one is, of course, which teams are most popular. Uh, so the most popular team is Null, which is basically Buurtnatuur, the first team, when there wasn't no team reporting yet. Then Cyclofix, uh, which has been heavily promoted, and we've done a mapathon for it. So uh, it's seen 187 edits on the Cyclofix team. Then 62 edits on bookcases. I was a little surprised to see such a high amount there. But that's a very fun team. And there's a few bookcase enthusiasts who discovered the team. And when I check every week, there's like one or two edits on the bookcase team. The defibrillators were quite popu uh, popular as well. Then ghost bites. Uh, which is an other surprising one. Lots of people don't even know what a ghost bike is, so that's a memorial uh, as a, a, a bicycle which is painted white, and it's placed where a cyclist has been killed in a, a traffic crash. Uh, then benches, uh, Buurtnatuur, the original map complete team, which should be 
uh, added together with this one. So that was the team causing the most uh, uh, change sets up till now. Artworks, the personal team, which is very hard to say exactly what it was. Trees was also pretty popular. Uh, shops too, toilets. And then there's a whole list, a long list of small teams which saw a few edits. Uh, most of them were like little experiments or like one-offs, like I want to make a team for that. And then uh, quite some saw like one edit. So I've added the ping pong table one once, I've added the picnic table once, stuff like that. So uh, there's even this thing, I have no idea what this team is, but uh, you catch the drift. And then at last I have another gra uh, fancy thing for you. Um, the number of edits over time. Uh, so here you can clearly see a few uh, time frames. So here you have the summer holidays. Uh, at this point, uh, so the original one was Buret Natur, was about forests and parks. Here, the first communication, the first email went out like, hey, uh, dear people, we have a, um, a new tool and you can map some information about nature near you. So that's why we see a first spike here. And then it goes on. Then there's this huge spike here. This is when we did a mapathon uh, for Cyclofix within Open Summer of Code. So people went out and mapped bicycle pumps, bicycle shops, but mostly bicycle parkings. We put in the bicycle parking specifically to let people do stuff. And then it went on. We had we have a second spike uh, somewhere in. August, I think it's this one, where another mailing went out from Buret Natur, and then it just goes on, and I see a few edits every now and then, especially on, on uh, weekends, we see that there's like the periodic uptick, because people go out in the weekend, and people at the weekends, they map benches, and they map all the kind, all the, the, the kind of small stuff that's fun to map. So... So yeah, we see that adoption is coming and people are uh, getting interested more and more. Uh, furthermore, I'm also trying to do more stuff to uh, find some funding for it. For example, uh, if there's a project which would fit map complete well, I uh, try to be part of that project. Um, one of these projects I'm doing now is for the province of Antwerp, where they want a map complete thing for like playgrounds and sport pitches. So that one is coming up uh, within the next few weeks. Uh, we're also in the running for another one uh, for uh, uh, cycle safety again. So uh, we'll see where it goes. And if you have a, a very specific team, uh, you want to have worked out, then you can contact me. So, uh... so yeah. So the questions were mapping stats, uh, past projects were the Cyclofix, the Buret Natur, the planned projects is the uh, the playground thing, uh, and then the official teams you can find on the website. Uh, and another question was, what is the roadmap? For now, the roadmap is maintenance, and if there is a cool project, then I'll jump the project, but sadly, I don't have the time available to invest a lot to make it bigger, unless, of course, there's uh, someone funding some of my time. Are you looking for some help for the, for the code, the source code, source, source code? If you want to, I can... Uh, well, if people want I to. <laughs> or if people want to, I can show you around. I do think the most interesting thing right now is the documentation on how to create your own team. I'm going to post that in the chat, but there's a little document. And people who are who know OpenStreetMap, who know the decking scheme, and who aren't afraid of um, of some JSON, they can follow the 
documentation and they can step by step create their own team with their own visualization. Uh, there's also a custom team generator available. So it's a website where you fill out what you want. It's very buggy. It's very broken. It's good to get started. It's good to get a basic team, but there's quite some features which are not available via there. And then you just draw, make the, the rough outline. You grab the source JSON and then you edit it in an editor to add a few missing touches and to finish it off. Uh, but it's good to get started. Uh, there's one caveat though. You need at least uh, 500 edits to make a team that's capable of editing and at least 200 edits to just generally make a team, which is read only. Uh, why is that? That's uh, because I feel that at around these numbers you have enough confidence and enough knowledge of OpenStreetMap to create your team. You have enough confidence to realize, oh, this is public, shared for everyone, and I can't just make a team for like touristical spots I want to visit with my friends when I'm going on holiday on Paris. Uh, or, yeah, another reason is like, um, otherwise, if you do not have the technical confidence, people will start making a team and then they'll get stuck and then they'll spam my issues and sadly I don't have the time available to help out every beginner with like, oh, you can do it like this and like that, so. Yeah, so that's, that's why one, I, uh, yeah, yeah one, go one, on. One of, the, one of those spamming uh, beginners is me. Uh, so I've, I've made uh, three different uh, teams uh, mm -hmm. by now. The first one is, is I hope, can, can be, uh, Adopted as an official team, so it, I mean yes. I'm not a programmer at all, but I do have I, I mean I'm technical in the eyes of most people, uh, of most normal people. I mean when I'm in OSM, it's like yeah, you know something. Um, anyway, um, and it's 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 difficult, but it's definitely feasible, um, and it's it's a lot of fun to to suddenly be able to do um, things that were totally impossible before. Um, Mm -hmm. So just uh, I for so the one I've been working on most was the camper sites, uh, so the places where you can dump your garbage specifically for campers, and that's that, that's the kind of thing that you really need to visualize to to actually let people know that it exists at all, um, and I, I think that's where a lot of the added value of Map Complete comes from. That it it really shows you the data <laughs> and in all its glory it's not just like here's a map no no here's here's twenty thousand details about some certain poi you didn't even know existed um mm -hmm. i i, I it, it shows the strength of, of having a flexible uh, data model um and so to extend a bit on on what uh, peter has been uh, talking about so we um uh, just the existence of Map Complete has made it a lot easier to talk to uh, municipal governments um, because it fills a gap uh, that they have. So uh, they have the uh, they have the tendency to map all the things that they want mapped in their own environment, but then it's all locked up. And if you're lucky, you can get a, PD a PDF. Sometimes even uh, a nice little web interface for the kind of uh, POIs that they collect. Uh, but it sits on a data island and they have a lot of work with it. And so here, and then we come along and say, hey, you just have to like have this one HTML page written together with us. And then you have a global database where you can put that little bit of data in and you can say, use the same HTML to make it uh, a nice little web map on your website. And you maybe you don't have much work because we might have mapped most of the stuff you're interested in already anyway. Um, so we're uh, the so there's for example most probably we're going to do a theme uh, about uh, garbage disposal. So I think uh, glass con uh, containers, textile containers, uh, which is the kind of stuff that people ask their municipality about, but the municipality doesn't even always know where all of them are, uh, because the, for example textile it's not their uh, responsibility mm -hmm. to organize it at all. Um, so there's uh, there's fun things uh, going on there. Mm -hmm. Another really fun 
uh, anecdote, or so to say, is that um, the Fietsambassade in Ghent, so it's like a cycling uh, NGO in Ghent, they made a little map of all the bicycle pumps they operate, and then I said, oh yeah, your map is cool, but this map is cooler. And then they switched over. And then it happened like already two times that I, I showed the map and someone, somebody said, oh, but there's a, a, a bicycle pump missing over there. And then people effectively go out to edit. So it's also really cool that people want to contribute and people take the time and effectively do it. Um, and even more funny is that um, the day that uh, the Fitzambassade Gent uh, adopted it onto their website, somebody went out and copied all the bicycle pumps in Osmond and uploaded it again. So suddenly there were like two versions of every bicycle pump online. Uh, so yeah, that was also a, one of the fun uh, uh, experiences. And at last, another thing is that it's really easy to make pictures of points of interest. Uh, and that's also a gap within the OpenStreetMap community that up till now it was a hassle to first upload a picture somewhere, whether it's Wikimedia or Mapillary or some other host. Uh, whereas, uh, and then you have to open some OpenStreetMap editor, add the image link, uh, whereas with MapComplete, I made it so that you just click a button, you take your picture and it's uploaded to ImageGur and then it's uh, automatically linked. So it's like r really, really easy to add pictures of specific points of interest. It's not perfect though. I, I, the current host is like ImageGur. It's free, it works, but I'd rather have it on, on Mapillary or on Wikimedia Commons. But I haven't come around to integrating with their API yet. So if there's some programmer out there who's feeling like uh, um, figuring out how these APIs work or have experience with it and can point me to some of the effectively working code, I know I've spent like a day digging through the, the Wikimedia APIs and I, I really couldn't figure out how it works because there's 20 endpoints and you need this endpoint for credential and then that endpoint to log in and then the third endpoint to do a pre-flight for an image upload and then a fourth to actually upload the image and then a fifth to add metadata for the image. So, yeah, and then I switched to Imgur and it was like, oh, here's your token, here's API, and it, I got it working in like 20 minutes. So that's a bit of uh, the history. Uh, also, uh, so adding images to uh, POIs is now just a click on a button, and in, if if you're on mobile, it's a click on the camera button, and it just adds it does the whole thing for mm -hmm. you. So it's it's never been as easy. Um, the same goes for opening hours. So there's a, a neat little interface that actually works on mobile as well, uh, which mm -hmm. is a, a a drag to write by hand. And uh, lastly, which I find as I've been dreaming about this for years. So sometimes I want I don't often want to hug people, but in this case, um, so it actually has an integration of reviews. Um, so there's a, a new uh, open review platform called Mangrove. Um, where uh, so where anyone can leave reviews about anything, um, mm -hmm. and and uh, Peter just made a little integration, and it seems yeah. I'm gonna I have it open so you can take a peek. The reviews are a little broken at the moment. Uh, oh yeah, so you can click on the stars, and then you can make a review. And the uh, opening hours interface is like. You just select, you click and drag. It's like Monday from this hour, and then Tuesday and Wednesday from these hours, and then Saturday this. And then during the holidays, it's closed, and that's it for inputting opening hours, which is, I, I think it's really. So uh, this is a pretty nifty widget. 
and then there's of course also visualization of the opening hours from like from which hour to which hours it's actually opened so so I try my best to to make everything really user friendly and really as easy to use as is possible but it can still use a ton of polish and and there's still a lot of uh, of of, of uh, the one who, and too little time to actually do it and too much bugs cropping up left and right but uh, but yeah it already works Um, yeah, Ben said he can't switch on the camera, uh, but he was vergrendeld, uh, locked. So I, um, I'm going to un unvergrendel both of the Ben Abelshausens in the room. So <laughs> if you want, oh. yeah, it should work now. There's a lot of people locked. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. That's, yeah, I have no idea what happened there. Yeah, I have a button turn of meeting mute. Oh, so you locked everyone accidentally or something? I think oh. it's a default setting for the meetings. I can press it if you want, Jos. Do I let everyone talk? Sure. What could go wrong? Ben could start talking. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, Ben, yeah, ah, okay. Uh, but then you wanted to put on your camera just because, or? Well, no, but I was just wondering why it wasn't possible. <laughs> okay. And then, then I thought, well, now I cannot not turn on my camera. So then I did. That makes total sense. <laughs> Thank you for your intervention. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, everyone is unlocked. So if you want to be visible or if you want to say something it should be possible now so i i liked uh, ben's suggestion to uh to do a quarterly project with it uh with with map complete um it, the nice thing is that you can like you, you have a little part where you do all the data modeling um and then you have uh an interesting part where you have to actually go out into the street uh to uh to collect data so it's really a survey tool um so mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting idea. Um, and as it grows in teams, um, so I don't think you showed that, Peter. Uh, there's um, a simple way to combine teams. So if uh, when you say make your own uh, map complete map, then it actually just allows you to combine questions and, and layers from different layers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, no from different teams. Uh, so after a while, all the things that interest you will be available within MapComplete and, and you can start using it to easily add all sorts of different uh, points of interest yeah. when you're out there. Are you talking about the personal team? Uh, yes, yes, personal team. Yeah, I always. So yeah, you can take a peek. So there's the here, the personal team, it's only available after 20 edits, but then you can like mix and match, you can like say, oh, I want all the bicycle repair stations and the bicycle tubes, but I don't want the drinking water and I want the bookcases and the toilets and, and, and then it shows all the things you selected and then you have a, a like a a la carte uh, surveying tool. So if you pass by the defibrillator here, you can open it and you can see the picture of it and you can answer the questions while passing by where then if you pass the pump a little later you can just like have a look at the pump too so this gives it flexibility this was actually specifically added for the, the hardcore open street mappers which want a, a street complete like uh, experience so, so yeah. All right. If there is any more questions, then please ask. Or suggestions. 
Uh, can I ask an annoying question about uh, the boot not here? Um, yes. Because I noticed it uh, encourages people to add uh, accessibility to, for example, forests. But mm -hmm. what does access is yes to a forest mean? Does it mean it isn't private, or is it? Does it mean that you can wander freely through the forests, like you have the the vrij toegankelijke zones uh, in the forests of uh, A and B? Does access is yes mean that, or just that it isn't private and you can use some parts, most of the parts in the forest? That is actually a really good question. Um, I'm going to have a look on how it was worded on Buurt Natuur. Um, because accessibility on land use is not described in the wiki pages of OpenStreetMap. So no, <laughs> no. Well, it shouldn't be used there. <laughs> well, actually, we should reverse the question. What does access equals no mean? And access equals no for a nature reserve means that you cannot enter it because it's fenced off uh, because it's for example very vulnerable or if the conservator doesn't want people going in so that means that access equals yes means that you can just enter and you can roam around uh, normally that's on the path uh, but that doesn't imply that the forest is uh, owned by public uh, instance. So, if that's a suitable answer to your question. Um, yeah, but uh, I was really thinking about, just also because of your question about uh, the spill zones, there are also mm -hmm. those uh, free, the uh, free toegankelijke zones, which we could map to. And that feels a bit like a piece of forest with access is yes. Mm -hmm. But then so a uh, very toegankelijke zone is a is an area where you can walk and you do not have to stick on the paths, right? Yeah, yeah indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, maybe something that we should bring up on the tagging mailing list and we should uh, discuss on the the OSMBE talk uh, mailing list or the tagging mailing list because I, I didn't think about that I, I just the main reason for the access was like to inventorize which forests and which uh, which uh, nature reserves are not accessible whether it's on the bots or in general, so. Yeah, when access is no or an access is private on the forest, that it's, that's quite clear, but access is yes. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a bit uh, dubious. Yeah, indeed, so. uh, now that you mention it. Uh, it's all, yeah, it's, point is also that if you let people answer something, you have to record something that it's answered so that they don't get the same question over and over. So, uh, um, so is access equals yes, not the default setting. Uh, that's what Yannick uh, asked. I'm a bit confused about that, but... Um, on, on roads, it's it, it's implied. If you have a road and there's no access tag, then you say, okay, then it's access, mm -hmm. because, yes. Uh, on land use, it's not really defined. It's So it's... Mm -hmm. yeah. Unknown by default. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I have, uh, I'm, I'm working on a, a theme myself to map uh, straatgevel tuintjes. Uh, Mm -hmm. which is like miniature gardens to uh, uh, in front of, of houses. And I just built my own data model and, and I documented it, but I, I didn't go through the whole tagging proposal uh, system because, uh, yeah, we all know why. <laughs> um, 
uh, so maybe some people will complain about it, and then then I, I I do think if you create a map complete team, then you should take responsibility for some of the things that happens with it because you are really yep. enforcing a data model, much like the ID developers should do that which they often do, but not always. Um, so it, yeah, there's a certain kind of responsibility there, but it's also very hard to do it right. And it's very hard to um, like to, to actually get something done. Um, well, it's, it's very easy to get lost in endless discussions uh, and not ever mm -hmm. be able to finish something up. So there's a certain balance there. And I think it's always going to be hard. Uh, to, to find uh, the best balance. When you create your own team, is there a risk to make tagging mistakes? Sorry? Yes. When you make your own team, is there a risk to make oh, tagging yeah. errors? Well, uh, yes, but only structural ones. So no accidental errors. But if if you, as a team creator, create a, uh, invent a tag, then that's the tag that the thing uses. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. for the user, there is no or very little chance of accidentally making a tagging mistake. But if you fuck up in the team creator then every user will make a tagging mistake. So there are yeah. very few at the beginning, and then I fix them all at once. Another trick that you can apply is, for example, with the defibrillator team. There's like, the, whom is this defibrillator accessible to? And then it's like, it's uh, public, or it's like uh, for students or customers, or it's only for people in the building, so it's private. And then there's a freeform field. And then if someone fills out the freeform field, a fix me tag is applied also. And fix me tag reads like, hey, this has been filled in, uh, or this field has been filled in with map complete. You'll probably want to double check it. So, uh, and, and that's one way where you can like safeguard and then the team creator can like once in a month query all these things, check the values and remove them. I've done something similar for the original Buret Nature. So every time someone added a forest or a park or a, a playground, there was a fix me attached, like made with map complete geometry still to the row. And then I checked up on them and now as Buret Nature itself is completely dead. I've uh, cleaned them all up and I've removed all the the stuff that was like questionable or was like looked like it was someone's garden or, or stuff like that. But on the other hand, quite a few nature reserves were added that way, which really had an outline. And then I also did some uh, some mapping of them, and I I discovered some new nature reserves or some weird gardens like. Wutzeltuinen or like kind of open gardens which aren't really a, a part, but yeah. So we saw quite some some interest from quite some people for like these weird things that are very difficult to map always. And um, another thing I noticed, especially with with Buurtnatuur, is that people used Buurtnatuur to describe like access conditions for slow roads. It was like uh, a little piece of forest with a, a, a tractor and then it, the, the access description would be like, it used to be accessible, but it has been closed off by the farmer. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, so that was, uh, that was visible too. And then, yeah, I, I fixed that up. It should be on the road. But that also means that there is quite some interest for uh, for the other teams, especially the slow roads. So, uh, yeah, I see that Vincent already left, but uh, it could be very well fitting for a uh, Tragewegen or something like that, too. Yeah. Talking about leaving, um, so according to the agenda that existed in my head, uh, we have until 8. Um, but according to some other agendas, it's until 7.30. Um, so we have two more things on the agenda. If you have other 
us do feel free to leave us we will be only slightly sad um but at the yeah so in the official like, agenda was 7 30 but i think we always intend to eight but anyway uh if you can stay please stay because next up i'm gonna cut you short peter because we can talk about this forever um yeah uh i'm um, kind yeah. of finished so okay yeah okay perfect then my timing is good um it's also to stop myself. Um, uh, so next up, Jonathan, um, who will uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, road completion, and uh, and uh, perhaps we can give a little more context about the uh, other uh, government data sets that we're using. Uh, yes, so road completion project. So that has been a project on North Mind. Well, on OSM Belgium mind, even when before I joined, so <laughs> before 2016. Uh, so the the idea was to compare the road network in OSM to the well to the official road network. So well, in Belgium, it's each region has its own uh, official road network. So basically, to make sure we have all the roads. For in Belgium in in, in OpenStreetMap, that was the well, the first goal, the main goal, and the subsequent goal was to give some feedback about the quality on their data to the to each each region because we well we have a quite active community so we are pretty sure that we have roads that are maybe not in the official uh, networks but also that we know that there is in official uh, networks, probably roads that do not exist anymore and that have been deleted in OpenStreetMap meanwhile. So the idea was really to improve uh, OpenStreetMap dataset, but also improve, uh, well, the three official dataset for, for each region. Um, yeah, luckily in Belgium, the road networks are available as open data, which is quite convenient. Um, I'll try to share my screen. Peter, I will steal you the presenters, right? Sorry. Um, there we go. That's the agenda. We do not really care. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so the idea is every week. There is a little process. Well, there, there is some. Uh, yeah, I can send the link. So all the documentation and code is on uh, is on GitHub. Uh, so the idea is, each week we download the road, the, uh, the road network datasets from well, uh, Flanders and, and Brussels. Unfortunately, for Wallonia, it's a bit more complicated. So I have to download it manually, and then it compares. Uh, well, all the roads that are in the official data set to all the roads we have in in OpenStreetMap, and it gives a little uh, summary. So, well, for Brussels, we only and then, yeah, um, so we we only compare the geometry. So, no, if the name is different, we do not make those kind of well. At least for now, we do not not do not make those kind of uh, of checks. So basically, we just check if there is a line at the same spot, well, almost at the same spot in, in both data sets. Uh, it could be a, a road that's drawn differently, or it could be a, a piece of the road missing at the end of the road. Uh, yeah, it could be really, uh, small, small mistakes. So for, for Brussels, well, as you can see, the, it's almost complete. We only miss uh, four roads of pieces of road, and yeah, I checked. We do not miss any road, so uh, I need to make the, the update. Uh, for Flanders, as you can see, it's going really nicely uh, down. We have someone that's actively uh, mapping the roads in uh, in Flanders, so we now only miss less than 5,000 roads or pieces of roads. Uh, so yeah, we started. Yeah, the, the, we don't have the old story, but I think we started around eight or nine thousand. So that's going, uh, that has a, a nice space. And then, yeah, for Wallonia, it's a, a data set per province. So you have the data uh, per province. So, yeah, 
Pavon Wallon is almost complete. Uh, and now that's going down uh, quickly as well. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I don't think uh, well, I'm working on those two. Uh, well, I started to work on those two, so the well, the next provinces will uh, will follow. Uh, and then yeah, the, our friends from uh, Kosovo also give, give it a try. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't run the the update uh, recently, uh, but yeah, they wanted to give a try. So yeah, the 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 the, the tool is is, uh, is available basically if you have any open data road network, you can uh, send it to the to the tool and it will run the comparison. So it should work for anywhere in the world basically. Uh, yeah, it, the the process is also split in really small pieces. So even for a country that's way bigger than Belgium or, or Kosovo, that should uh, work just as well. Um, yours, yeah, for the Luxembourg, uh, yeah, for now the well, the update is well still waiting for them to to finish the yeah the. Pull request to, to to make to make it happen for Luxembourg. So I don't have any news from uh, from our friends in in Luxembourg. Um, so yeah, that's a little yeah some statistics to basically see the line go down because we like to see numbers <laughs> numbers go down um, and how it works or how the users can uh, well how you can uh, help the the work is for each region, there is a challenge in, in MapRoulette. So if we take uh, Wallonia, for instance, so that's a little tool with, where each piece, missing piece of road, well, each road that the process considers as missing is a task. Also, I can see I already cleaned the west of, uh, the west of Belgium. Um, and if I, well, the reds are not, so if I take a little task randomly, then you see the missing piece of road. So here, apparently, at some point it was a straight road, and now it's a it's a roundabout. So that would be considered as not an issue. Well, I need to check on the I really imagery, but it's probably not an issue. But from this tool, you can edit uh, that will open well your default editor. In my case, it's ID. We've seen indeed that apparently seems to be a new roundabout, uh, but in the case it was really a missing piece of road, you just had to draw it or extend the piece of road that missing, save it to OpenStreetMap, and then you can mark mark the task as fixed, and so on. So I'll mark it as not not an issue, and then yeah, you can choose uh, the next task to be completely random in Bel well in, in this case in Wallonia or continue to work on a nearby task. Well, in this case, it switched to the task next to it, so not an issue as well. well and so on, okay. I guess you get the, <laughs> you get the point. Um, but those, not an issue. Uh, that's the roads that we plan to send back, in this case, to, to Service Public de Wallonie to say, hey, well, at this spot in uh, where I am, uh, Felui, uh, we notice that in your official data set, it's, it's still a straight road, but we know that, well, from our imagery, more, more recent uh, imagery, we know that it's, uh, that it's, uh, it's a roundabout. So, well, we know that all roundabout is, is the correct version and you should update your, uh, your data set. It's still not that, that part of feedback to the, to the, to the three regions is not active yet, but we do keep somewhere all those uh, false positive uh, to, well, at some point when, when we have enough or when we have a contact there, um, we, can, we can send that information that information back to them. Uh, so that's for Wallonia. Uh, for Flanders, it goes quite well, as also quite well. So you see that the, the coast is quite uh, cleaned already, uh, apparently this region as well, probably someone lived there. <laughs> I know someone living there uh, and probably someone living in that uh, on Lille. 
uh, so well, so Mapbox decides to map around the well, to fix the task around the, the house, which obviously makes sense. Uh, and yeah, for Brussels, it's it's only uh, yeah, few, those are not really missing roads. Uh, but yeah, you can well if you want, you can uh, join the task force. It, it's quite well. I do a few a few uh, a few dozen of of roads uh, once in a while uh, in Wallonia. It's quite relaxing just to see. Uh, I really imagery and, and draw lines because it's really that easy. You just have to draw lines. Um, uh, yeah, I see that there was a question from Thibault. Uh, for yeah, for my bullet, uh you can leave a comment if you want. Uh, there is no plan at the moment to do something with those comments. Uh, so the process just take the the, the all the tasks mark not as an issue just as not an issue we do not uh, do something with the with the comment but yeah if you want to leave a comment to explain why you think it's not an issue uh feel free to do so at some point it will probably uh be be useful but for now considering the number of roads we still have to fix uh i think yeah you can do as quick as you as you can or, or as quick as you want do not you don't well if you have extra information feel free to to, to write those but yeah we consider yeah, that we we just got a word from the flemish government that they do intend to finally start using our feedback okay, and nice. these these not an issue metadata can be can be useful in that case okay. i think okay. uh, because not an issue can mean um, someone already mapped this and i mean you should oh. hit uh, already fixed then but or if you don't understand why you saw it at all then you also use uh, not an issue uh, but also when the data is wrong so some yeah like ben i sometimes did it and not always i mean at some point you stop caring <laughs> but if you care <laughs> leave a note yeah. So, yeah, yeah, and there, so there's yeah. also the the sorry the the too hard uh, can see button um which in the next phase we should probably turn into maybe a map complete complete challenge to check it in the field uh, yeah so the idea is really to mark well i fixed it if you really fixed it not an issue like in this case well it's not an issue because well, what's in openstreetmap is correct and what's in the official data set is wrong which because now it's a it's a roundabout uh, you can decide it to skip it because you don't like it for any reason but you sometimes it's it's a path in the middle of the forest and then on the on the aerial imagery you only see trees so obviously you cannot fix it so you can just mark it as too hard can see and that it will be uh, skipped the next time uh, yeah it will be skipped and if it's for some reason already mapped in OpenStreetMap, but that hasn't been detected by or two yet uh, you can mark as already fixed so for now, we only take the not an issue as well, not an issue. So as false, false positive, uh, all the all the others are uh, yeah, considered as uh, uh, fixed, uh, yeah, or, or well fixed or or, or skipped. Um, yes, uh, yeah. There is a little uh, instructions. Uh, please do read the instructions. It's quite small uh, because yes. Uh, the, uh, in Wallonia, not so much, but apparently in the Flanders data set, there are quite a lot of uh, private driveways. So please, well, skip it if you don't want to mark uh, to to map driveway driveways. But if you map it, well, map it, uh, tag it correctly with the driveway tag and and, and private because usually uh, driveways are private. Um, yes. Did I forget anything? Uh, yeah, if you like more information about the history of the project, uh, you can find it in the repo. Um, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, for, uh, also, uh, well, you can go in the in, in the code. We only now uh, process from the official data set the roads that have a name. Uh, because there are well, a lot of roads that do not have a name, and to make a reasonable amount of roads to to process, 
we decided to only take the one that have a name. But, so that's why you, you see a big peak at the beginning of, uh, well, if I take uh, Bravo Wallon, you see a big peak or, or even worse for Renault. Uh, at the first time I ran the process, so there was almost 7,000 roads considered missing in in NO in OpenStreetMap, which was well, way too much. So when I filtered to only take the road with a name, we went down to uh, well, a bit more than 1,000. Uh, and well, in those cases, it's apparently in, uh, in the big data, data set for Wallonia, there are a lot of, uh, well, what, what they consider roads, but in the middle of the fields that, well, are really not existing in on the on the field. Uh, so yeah, for for this first uh, first batch, we only filter on the on the rows with a name, hoping that we when we go down to almost uh, zero road missing in, in OpenStreetMap. Uh, and we, well, if we if we get there at some point, I guess we'll switch to all the roads or add a, a bit of a filter a bit broader to to tackle uh, a bit a bit more roads that uh, that could be missing. Um, yeah, so well, feel free, to, feel free to give it a try. Uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions if you have questions. Um, yes, exactly, Sep. Not if we get there, but when we get there. Because, yeah, as, as you saw, the well, it's a nice little curve going down and down for, uh, for each region. So, well, we're getting there. Uh, and so when we get there, so we will never stay there. Uh, so the end goal is that the number goes to zero and then at the weekly update, uh, we have a few new cases and those are then actually new cases that were mapped by the government before they were mapped by OpenStreetMap. And, and when we reach that point, then we can say that we are uh, as complete, at least, as the government data and uh, almost as uh, up to date as the government data. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's I think I have an example. Yep. Uh, well, not here. But yeah, if, uh, if I take uh, back, so when I run it, uh, in January, there was 30,482 uh, roads, and a few a few weeks later, there was yeah uh, a few roads more in the official data set, uh, but there were also more roads in OpenStreetMap <laughs> uh, data set. So yeah, the idea is since it's, it runs every week, and usually uh, the well, I don't know how often the, the, each region updates its data set, but as soon as there is an update in the official data set, we'll, the, well, the process will download the last version. And so if there are new roads in their data set, it will be compared with the OpenStreetMap data set. So since it, it runs every week, we'll, we should be able to indeed go to down to zero and that a little peak if there is a new neighborhood, let's say, with a few st new streets that for some reason are not mapped in OSM yet. And then back to zero, and that a little peak a few a few months or, or years later. Uh, that's yeah. Well, we I hope we'll get there at some point. Um, We're getting there <laughs> slowly. <laughs> yeah, and uh, as I said, it's really relaxing. I do that. Uh, yeah, it's no, it's relaxing. Yeah, we can use some help <laughs> with this mapping <laughs> challenge. Yeah, it's. Yeah. Perfect if you have a lot of meetings. <laughs> well, yeah, you can start now if you want. <laughs> <Perfect time. laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I don't know if there is any questions or uh, suggestions. Or, uh, or we do move on to the... Something's coming from Robin. Uh, uh, Jonathan, maybe I missed it, but did you mention the um, the micro grant? You probably ah, no, did. I didn't. No, you I didn't. didn't yeah. Indeed. So the nice little tools was uh, well, a prototype was built in 2018 during Open Summer of Code by some students, uh, and then well, we had a yeah, kind of a working version, but no one to to maintain it or to 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 run it. 
So when uh, the OSM OpenStreetMap Foundation uh, uh, yeah, opened their micro grant program last year, uh, we do we did apply to have a, a, a little budget of uh, I think it was five thousand euros um, to well to hire someone in, in this case me to to well to revive the project and to try to build. Uh, uh, well, an improved, an improved version of the tool with the idea of running it. Well, that would run automatically uh, as well as as often as possible. Uh, and yeah, thanks to the well, in this case, thanks to the OpenStreetMap Foundation, uh, we were able to well to get to to the point we are now uh, with that process running automatically uh, every week, uh, as I as I show you. Uh, Oh, perfect, Robin. Yeah, I would be more than happy to to assist you to to add a new a new, a new data sets to to the to the tool. Uh, so yeah, feel free to open an issue uh, an issue on the repo or a, or a pull request, and and we'll work together to to yeah to make that happen for um, for for the Netherlands. But yeah, yeah, as you saw, the, well, I think the, pull, the Luxembourg pull request, oh no, uh, well, it was an issue maybe, yes. But no, uh, it's still open, but uh, I don't have any any update on, on that data set. But yeah, no, as many, well, each new data set is, well, interesting for the, well, to, also to improve the process. Uh, because now, as I said, the, the comparison process is quite simple, it's only, geometry um, but yeah each each new data set has its own uh, particularities so it's also in interesting to have data set I do not know anything about to well also to improve the, the process and the way the, the tool uh, the tool works Yeah, well, I guess we can. Switch no, to yes. pick and GRB. Well, I think you know more about it than I do. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd keep it short. Um, so uh, on, on uh, so Brussels buildings were added <laughs> years ago. Uh, and are basically a solved problem. Um, uh, both in Flanders and Wallonia, we're now slowly importing uh, buildings with addresses um, from the official data. So there's there's tools in place to to make it easy. Uh, and there is a lot of work left to be done because we don't just copy paste. Um, preaching to the choir here, I suppose, but we don't just copy paste. We do integrate them into our data set, and that means that it's a lot of work and it can be rather fun if you also um, look at the addresses. Well, <laughs> depends on your definition of fun. Uh, but I personally enjoy uh, checking the addresses and comparing the and then looking if there's probable mistakes in the government data sets and reporting those errors and stuff like that. So you're improving two data sets at once and that always feels productive. Um, if, if you're interested in that, please just join one of our channels and, and, and we'll talk about it. It's not something you can really do uh, on yourself without uh, at least some introduction and, and working together. So if anyone is interested in doing that kind of work, please speak up now and then we can go into it in a little more detail. Um, if not, I'll go to the next topic. Okay. Uh, so, um, oh, Ben is typing, but Ben knows what he's doing. So, <laughs> Boo Buildings, yay roads. I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm also importing buildings as well as doing roads. But well, um, all right. Um, so uh, let's, uh, as a final session, I'll try to keep it short. Um, uh, news from the OpenStreetMap Foundation. Um, 
and I was supposed to talk about how it's relevant to Belgium too, but I didn't really get into that. Um, so um, what can we say about that? And uh, so 2020 was a pretty productive year um, in, in the foundation. Um, so the, the, the OpenStreetMap Foundation is, is the very tiny organization that keeps OpenStreetMap afloat. Uh, it's the owner of the data. Uh, it's the owner of the central infrastructure, and it isn't very much more than that. So there's a few working groups where uh, where people make sure that servers start run uh, keep running, uh, that some minimal communication is being done, um, that data issues are being solved. Uh, you have the, the data working group um, and, and uh, things like that. Uh, but there is not even one real employee. There's about one, uh, well, there's two full-time equivalents by now, but they work uh, under a contract basis. Um, so it's pretty small, um, but it was also cracking at its seams. Um, so the, the project had been growing for a long time and it's growing ever faster. Um, and uh, the foundation didn't really, uh, um, there was a sort of a backlog uh, building up. Uh, and 2020 has been pretty good on that, uh, on, on, uh, on clearing some of that backlog. So we had um, uh, three new board members at the start of the year, um, uh, Alan, Guillaume, and Rory. Um, especially, uh, well, Alan does deserve a special mention because he's uh, basically giving a, a half time uh, to the job. So so most people do a few hours every week, but he's, he's almost like, we are working it. Uh, so he's a recently retired American diplomat. Um, I used to think diplomats were diplomatic. They just get the job done. Um, it's, it has little to do with each other. Um, and Guillaume and Rory were also uh, really uh, nice additions to the team. Um, and they and and they replaced uh, some more radical members. So we had Fre uh, Frederik Ram, who is known as not uh, as quite outspoken and and has very specific uh, opinions about stuff. Um, and on the other side, you had um, uh, Heather, uh, who comes from a humanitarian background and also was pretty radical on some other stuff. So um, uh, somehow the tone softened a lot and it became a lot more easy to, to all work together with this new team feeling. So I, I was part of that team myself, but I retired at the, at the end of the year. Um, so this is a little bit of self-promotion in a way, but not really because uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be um, more free now. Uh, so um, it's the year started with a lot of, of listening. Um, so traditionally, the OSMF would just listen, or, or well, it would feel like it would just listen to one mailing list uh, with relatively few people and even fewer people who actually interact. Um, so there were, there were a small group of, of people who seemed to dominate uh, everything that happened. And that, that really changed uh, over the last year. Um, there was an active outreach to, to individuals, uh, to, to people with a certain standing within the project. Um, also reviving uh, relations with uh, corporate members and local chapters. Um, an interesting uh, thing was that the, um, the one of the corporate members mentioned like, yeah, and all those years we've been around the project, no one has ever asked us to talk about anything. So they were really very surprised. And and that's a little weird because uh, a lot of, I mean, we have to be careful with corporations um, in, in a way, uh, but often their interests do align. So at least you have to keep talking. Um, and uh, even internally within the board, so uh, the, the meetings used to be all uh, audio only, and, and we took the revolutionary step to, to add video to the mix. Um, and, and that, yeah, it was really special because then we could see each other's expression and not always be listening to Frederick all the time. Um, so it, it, it was a large improvement. Uh, and Corona also made a life easier in a way. Uh, because it, it was a lot easier to do all kinds of impromptu meetings. Uh, some of the independent workers could free up their schedule because they had no work at all. So they, they could um, uh, do meetings during the day. Um, 
so uh, that that's a bit of context for that. Um, and that allowed us to address some of the core problems that had been uh, building up, like uh, a technical backlog. Um, so uh, fundamentally, the, the one of the most obvious signs of of, of the cracking of, of the foundations was that the the tiles were uh, the tile servers were getting slower and slower, um, and and it just became untenable to to do all the technical core uh, maintenance by just uh, two volunteers who also had uh, full time jobs. So that issue still isn't fixed, but it's it normally there should in the short term be a full time uh, sysadmin to to make sure that things are running um, and around their work. There's a lot of new energy in the uh, or, uh, operations working group to to support core development. Um, and uh, 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 similar uh, in the same topic of the technical basis. So ID development used to be financed entirely by the by the corporate sector. And while they were in, in independent in what they did, uh, it's a bit annoying that it's the whole process of the main uh, editor being developed by uh, entirely outside of the foundation was a bit risky. And so when that became suddenly became a problem, then the the board uh, found uh, financing from uh, a lot of people in the corporate sector um, who then pay to the OSMF and, and OSMF pays for the development. So instead of, of being dependent on one company uh, paying the wage, it's suddenly an OSMF pro, uh, run project, which I think is a, a huge improvement. Um, there were also some experiments with small funding. Uh, uh, for example, one of the examples is a bit silly, perhaps, uh, but they um, uh, we, we we kept uh, potlatch alive. Um, which uh, why not? Why not? I like potlatch. Um, and uh, um, so. Doing those kinds of projects makes it more interesting to to be a part of the working groups because now they're actually uh, working. Um, so when when you have a few projects that are actively going forward, it becomes more interesting to to join these working groups. At least that's what we hope because it's still a challenge to to get people involved there. Um, uh, and then uh, so OpenStreetMap at at its core is a is. A, a community and not the technology. Uh, so we, we need people above all else. And uh, so there was a lot of work um, on, on that. There's a lot left to be done. Uh, so some steps to uh, making it the, the OSMF environment and, and hopefully OpenStreetMap in general a more uh, diverse and inclusive uh, organization where people from all sorts of backgrounds feel at home um, and where hopefully people one day will realize that if you communicate in a global context, everyone has to change how they communicate. It's, it's a very tough message to a lot of people, apparently. Um, then uh, we also made it more interesting to join the OpenStreetMap Foundation by making it um, a condition for uh, receiving a micro grant. So suddenly there was a potential. Uh, if, if you're a member, then you can get like freebies, you can get actual money to, to do your projects. Um, and it also shows that the OSMF like cares about the small things that are happening in, in, uh, in communities around the world. And, and these little, so the, there were, uh, there was a budget of 50,000 uh, euros uh, for, I think in total 12 projects or something like that, um, who with that small money could, could really make a difference. So that was, I think it's a, a good investment. Um, then uh, the uh, so the OpenStreetMap Foundation until 2019 only had local chapters in Europe. Um, so the official rep that so local chapters are official representatives of the OpenStreetMap project within their country. Uh, like OpenStreetMap Belgium is for Belgium, um, and it's a little tough to join. Um, and it's uh, well. It was always uh, challenging, and so in, in the last year, uh, we managed to guide 
excuse me, we, we managed to guide uh, chapters from four new continents to uh, to join as a local chapter. So suddenly we have uh, people or organizations from five uh, continents instead of one uh, in there. So that was uh, really great. And um, significantly also the United States chapter, um, which I mentioned separately because there was always a, a, a huge cultural bridge between the foundation and uh, the open and the US community, um, which is weird because the foundation should be global. So, and and so I, I think that bridge is, is now finally getting, um, that gap's getting breached, sorry. Um, similarly, there's uh, talks going on with, with HOT to find a more productive uh, relationship together. That also has, uh, it's, it's complicated, but I guess we'll get there in the end. Um, and the last aspect of that uh, of that uh, widening of the community is uh, that there is finally a clear and easy uh, pathway to costless membership. So it, it used to be paid. It took us years to get. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Ben. Um, <coughs> uh, it took us years to get some sort of exception in place for people to join without having to pay. But now we finally have like a very clear program where we say, hey. If you contribute to the project, we want you to be part of the foundation because that's what, I mean, it's obvious. It should be obvious. It should always have been obvious. Um, so with that, we had an influx of hundreds of new members, uh, which is like a 30% increase or something um, uh, because of, of that new program. And, and a lot of that helped to, to diversify uh, the kind of countries that our members are, are coming from. Um, so that was a fun ride. Uh, now, after all these changes, and, and I didn't even mention them all, so a lot was changed in a short uh, time period. And, and as things go in, in OpenStreetMap, um, people are involved in very different ways, and there's channels all over the place, and it's impossible to keep track of stuff. Um, so um, I guess the new board uh, was a little afraid or, or was interested to see, are people still following? And so they did a, a large uh, survey, a very large survey, over 2,000 people participated um, uh, um, to, to see if, if people are happy with the direction that the board is going. And I, I think I, I posted the link in the, in the shared notes. Uh, I, I think the results are generally uh, positive. Um, so do have a look at that. And finally, I posted the link with a more detailed yearly report for uh, last year. So in, in, in general, I, I do feel that in the last year, a lot of the backlog was was closed and fa some foundations were laid to, to, to keep supporting the OpenStreetMap uh, project. Um, because really, the, the base was getting too small for everything that's, that's uh, built on top of it. Um, there's a lot of work left to be done, and it's easy to make an impact. Uh, if, if a fool like me can get elected there, then people like you can absolutely uh, help the project along in a significant way. I should go into politics, or perhaps not. Um, OK, so if you have any questions, do speak up or put them in the chat. Um, and uh, that's the last agenda item, unless someone has something totally different that they want to discuss. Yes, I know, Ben. I didn't. I don't know. Is there anything specifically for Belgium? I, uh, I, have, yeah, it was in my mind to talk about that, but I am um, no. I, yeah, no. Is there something very Belgian about this? <laughs> We almost got a Belgian bank because the bank kicked us out, uh, the UK bank. Well, and we had a Belgian uh, on the OSMF board, so that's sort of <laughs> that's also something. Yeah. yeah, no, indeed, we do also have. Uh, so ben, uh, ben is the third board member, and is yeah part of the. Advisory board inside the uh, OSMF. Um, then I don't really get your point. Maybe you should just speak up. 
Yeah, no, I was just saying that well, there, uh, any anything to uh, news related to the foundation that is related to Belgium. Hmm. The only is the only thing I think is that that they have started listening to the advisory board, and I think that's the only. Right. Yeah. The yeah. Only yeah. change. Yes. Yeah. So the yeah. So the local chapters within the foundation. It used to be a totally empty. I mean, like it, it did. Ha it didn't have any real benefit, and that's a little better now. But I think there's still a long way to go to, um, to make the, the those voices here heard a lot more. So um, several of uh, of us here uh, are active in the local chapters and communities working group, which is a working group within the OpenStreetMap Foundation that. Um, that focuses on how all the lessons learned in the in the different parts of the international community can can influence what the OpenStreetMap Foundation does. Uh, so uh, one aspect of that is is that everyone's building the same tools over and over again, and maybe we can uh, help uh, standardize that and and offer tools to the global community so that they just can pick what they need. Um, Uh, so Inari, uh, the, um, Japan is now has now applied to become a local chapter, but it's really it's an official process. So it it's not enough to to have an active local organization uh, to become a local chapter. You have to actually sign a contract with the foundation, uh, which comes with uh, with a few conditions and and a lot of discussion and and thinking if it's a, a good idea or not. Um, so Japan doesn't have to um, doesn't have to be a local chapter to be able to do a lot of the things a local chapter does. So it's just it's more like a formal recognition. But in the the Adobe application is open and yeah, well, Japan, was, Poland, uh, uh, Uganda. Yeah. There was a there was a copyright issue with the uh, Japan uh, like in in Japan they registered the trademark as well and that made made everything very complicated and now we have a in the new contract the uh, for local chapters that's that's uh, there's better rules in place to to deal with that so that's why it was revived now finally Okay. Okay, I would say this is the time for beer and to switch off the recording. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> So as, as, as Ben is saying, uh, being a local chapter means that you can now legally and officially do what everyone is doing anyway, which is nice. Oh, Sep is already having beers. That's not fair. You should have waited for us. OK, um, I'm going to uh, turn off the filming and consider the meeting officially closed. Uh, right. So, welcome everyone.